Yesterday I showed you a lot of biochemistry lab equipment, but I didn't show you some of my favorite. The stuff we use for protein chromatography, um, which is a way that we, set, we purify proteins by sending them flowing through um, different little be columns formed with different little beads called resin um, that have different properties and that separate proteins based on those properties. Um, so we can do it in gravity flow where we fill columns like this. Um, but for that, we usually do it in the cold room, which I really, really hate because it's cold. Or we can do it um, with this FPLC um, machine. So this is an ACTA. Um, and so basically what it does is it has these different columns with different properties. Um, and then all these tubes and stuff, basically it can flow your protein through the columns at different flow rates and things. Um, and then it goes through some detectors, and so your proteins are going to show up as these little like peaks on this graph. Um, so there's a UV detector, and so proteins absorb UV light, and so you'll get like a peak when the protein comes off, and we call that, we call when the protein comes off the column, we call it elution. Um, so when your protein elutes, you'll see a peak, and then you can have the machine collect the um, protein in different sorts of trays and um, like blocks and different tube sizes um, and so then you go and you look at the machine and you say okay the protein I want should be in this fraction um, and then you go to that block or that tube and you take your protein and it's pure. So there are different advantages and disadvantages to using the uh, machine versus the gravity flow. Um, so I'll discuss um, this a little bit of detail about that in the text. Um, today I just want to kind of give you an overview of some of the different types of chromatography. Um, so yeah, so today I'm actually going to be using both gravity flow and um, the ACTA. And so fingers crossed that this protein prep goes well. So let's look at chromatography. The word chromatography means writing in color. and the name chromatography actually comes from when the scientists were separating colored compounds. You might have done something similar in school or even accidentally if you ever stuck um, like a mark with the marker on a paper towel and you got that wet and then the colors would separate. What's happening is that the different colored dyes interact differently with the paper towel um, and with the water that you got it wet with and so some of them will travel further because they like the water more some of them will travel less far because they like the paper towel more the same kind of concept is present in protein chromatography so the basic idea with any chromatography is that you have two phases um, typically a stationary phase so that would be your paper towel or in the case of protein chromatography it's this um, the little beads which we call resin which are in these columns and then you have a mobile phase so that would be the water that you got the um, spot wet with or the buffer so the salt um, salty pH stabilized water that our proteins are surrounded in that would be our mobile phase with protein chromatography and then you have things dissolved in the um, in the different phases. So in our mobile phase that we put in, we have a bunch of proteins. And then these proteins are going to separate as they go through, move um, past the, or through the mobile, the stationary phase. They kind of have a choice. Do they want to hang out with the stationary phase? So do they want to bind to the resin? Or do they want to stay with the mobile phase? Are they happy in the water? Um, and so different proteins have different properties and so they're going to interact differently with the um with the resin and this is going to impact how long it takes them to get through the column and they might even get really stuck so i like to think of it kind of like going to a museum like if i go to a if i go to some like super geeky biochemistry museum with my family it's going to take me a lot longer to get through that museum than they are because I'm going to get really attracted to all the different exhibits. And similarly, if I go to like some biker museum, I'm going to go through that pretty fast. Whereas someone who likes bike, um, like biking might be really um, like engaged with the museum and it'll take them a long time. So basically the idea is that 
different kinds of resin are kind of like different museums and we can separate proteins based on their properties but how much they like those different um, types of things and typically what we're doing when we do protein chromatography at least um, and the type of work I do is preparative chromatography. So here we're, it's different than analytical scale chromatography where you're just kind of trying to get a look at what's inside. With preparative chromatography, you're actually trying to purify the stuff to save it. So typically what this is the what happens is we take a um, this, we at least in my case we do recombinant um, protein expression. So basically we take the gene, for the genetic recipe for the protein, and we stick it in some vector, which is just a piece of um, DNA we can use to stick it in a different kind of cells to um, and have those cells express the protein. And because we're controlling the gene, we can control um, the sequence. And so what we do is we can add, um, as we'll see later, we can, if we want, we can add like a tag on the end. So add an extra sequence of protein letters, amino acids, um, and that's going to serve as the sort of like tag we can use to fish our protein out. But um, I have more posts on this, but so I'm not going to go into too much detail on it here for the sake of time, um, but just know that we can do that. So we express the protein, and then what happens is we have to kind of like free it. So it starts with lysis, so we break those cells open. Um, then we spin them down really fast with ultracentrifugation. This is going to separate the like the membrane bits and stuff from the soluble stuff, which contains our proteins, assuming that we're purifying um, a soluble protein. And then we go to the chromatography step. And so this here we're going to flow that liquid that has our protein through these columns filled with these little beads. And we can separate them based on different things, like their unique features, like an affinity tag, which I talked with. That's what I was talking about before, how we can add a few extra letters. We can also separate them by natural properties, such as their charge um, and their size. And so we have different types of resin that we can use for all of these. So the first step that you do is often an affinity chromatography step, uh, like a capture affinity chromatography step. So here your bind the resin has something that's going to bind specifically to something specific about your protein. So this is often that tag that you put on the end, but it can also be something um, like natural about your protein, like if it has a natural binding partner, you can have resin with um, that binding partner like attached um, or like antibody specific for that protein. Um, but here, so a couple of common, the good thing about these affinity tags that you can add is that they're specific, they have specific binding partners like that you can buy this pre-made resin for. Um, so anybody can stick the same tag on any protein and use this same like commercially available resin. So a couple of common examples are his tags. So this is just a string of the letter histidine. Um, what's really great about histidine is that it will, um, it serves as a chelator, so it can like clamp down on metals. So you can use um, like a nickel coated column. The histidine tag is going to like claw onto that column. And then you can compete it off with a midazole, which is a little like a soluble version of histidine that doesn't have like the amino acid part, it just has that side chain. Um, so basically, the idea is that you stick your protein. Um, so here your protein gets stuck, everything else flows through, and then you compete your protein off with something that looks similar um, to the part that's stuck. Um, and so here with the his tag, you're using a midazole. Um, so this, this method is often known as IMAC, immobilized metal affinity chromatography, because you're binding to that metal that's immobilized, so it's like stuck to the column. Um, another common one that I use is a strep tag. So it kind of mimics the um, strep davidin biotin interaction. Um, so you have this little like tag at the end of your protein and it's going to bind to this streptactin resin and then you compete it off with this thiobiotin. So it's the same kind of concept, just a different molecules. Um, typically when you do add an affinity tag, there's often like 
a protease recognition sequence. So protease is a protein cutter. Um, and so you put like, a, you know, include a recognition site so that the protease will cut off the tag when you're done um, with it. So basically, often what you do is you do this affinity chromatography step to separate your tagged protein from any non-tagged stuff. Um, then you cut off that tag. And so now you most your so you should your protein should be mostly pure, but it's not going to be totally pure. But now you've gotten rid of that unique thing, so you have to rely on property properties that are um, intrinsic to the protein. So these are like natural properties. And so one property that all proteins have is charge. So basically, a protein's charge is going to depend on its amino acid composition, so what letters it has, and the pH. So pH is a measure measure of uh, proton availability. Um, so protons are just like these positively charged H's and the basic idea is that at a low pH is an acidic condition, you have lots of free protons. Um, so there are some amino acids that will take up free protons when when you're at a low pH. And so then this is going to make them positively charged. Um, and or or neutral um, and then when you have a higher um, pH you have fewer proteins around and so the proteins are going to be deprotonated or so negatively charged or neutral depending on like their normal state and I have posts on this if you want to um, get into that but basically the charge is going to depend on the pH so at a low pH so in acidic conditions your protein is more likely to have a positive charge and so it's going to bind to negatively charged resin. And that's the form we call cation exchange because a positive ion is called a cation. And so an ion is just a charged thing, a cation is a positively charged thing. So here we have a positively charged protein, we're binding to negatively charged resin. And then we, um, with anion exchange, we have um, the opposite. So you have a positively charged resin and a negatively charged protein. So basically, you have the solution of proteins. They each have a different composition of amino acids, so they're each going to have different charges. You can then um, use this to separate proteins based on their charge. So if you flow a mixture of proteins through, the more if, if it's a cation exchange, the more um, the positive cha charged proteins are going to stick, and the negatively charged ones are going to flow through in opposite for the anion exchange. And then the exchange starts step comes in. So now you're actually going to usually um, add salt. Um, and so then the ions in the salt are going to compete off the protein. Um, so it's kind of like with the affinity um, chromatography we saw where we like competed off with the midazole or dicylobiotin, except here we're competing off with salt. And there, you can also do it by changing the pH, but that has more um, potential to hurt your protein because proteins like certain pHs. Um, so basically you have something like this where you tip, so you often do this with the acta. Um, so you're, you have a mix of, um, the acta can like combine buffers. So you have a no salt and a high salt, and then you can make a gradient or you can do also do like a stepwise solution if you know what, um, what concentration of salt will push your protein off. Um, so the least oppositely charged comes off first, and the most oppositely charged comes off last. So basically, the more the protein is oppositely charged to the resin, the more strongly it's going to stick to that resin, and the more salt it's going to take to come off. Whereas ones that are only like weakly charged are just going to kind of bind a little, but not a lot. Um, so it doesn't take much to push them off. So in this way, you can separate the proteins based on their natural charge. And unlike the affinity step where you kind of were hoping to get rid of like everything before your protein. Here it doesn't really matter if your protein comes off first or last. It's just this, that, that they get separated is the important part. So after ion exchange chromatography, your protein is more pure. And a lot of times it's probably pure enough for most things. Um, although you might want to do something to get rid of the high salt if you're in that condition. So you can use something like dialysis or whatever, but also another way to get rid of the salt and to purify it further is with size exchange chromatography, aka gel filtration. So here the concept is a little different. So you still have resin that you're flowing your protein through. 
But here, you're separating by size, as the name implies, and in, your protein isn't really like interacting directly with the resin, so it's not like sticking to the resin, unlike in the other cases. With size exclusion chromatography, it's actually just like flowing through the resin, but it's taking different routes. Because within the, so basically these beads have um, a bunch of secret tunnels, and you can only get into that tunnel if you're small enough to enter. So I like to think of it as like this long mesh of roads and with tunnels, and so if you can't fit through the tunnel, you have to, um, you don't have to go that way. And so you get to take shortcuts. So the smaller proteins have to go through all these tunnels, and so they have to take a longer route. So all the proteins are traveling at the same speed, um, like the same speed, like from miles per hour or whatever standpoint. But they're traveling different distances. So the bigger proteins are going to get to take all those shortcuts. They don't have to go through those tunnels. They can go around the tunnels. Um, and so they're going to get there sooner. So, and the smaller proteins are going to have to go through all those tunnels, and so they're going to take longer to get through. So this is, um, so you basically have something like this, you inject it through, um, and then the bigger proteins are going to come off first, and the smaller proteins come off later. And so this is often um, gets confusing for people because with SDS page, it's the opposite. So with SDS page, the longer proteins are going to get tangled up more, so they're going to travel slower. But with the size exclusion chromatography, the, um, we're not getting tangled up in anything. They're all flowing through, but the bigger proteins don't have to go as far because the smaller proteins have to go through all those little um, side routes that the bigger proteins don't have to go through. So with size exclusion chromatography, the bigger things are going to come off before the smaller things. Um, and after size exclusion chromatography, your protein should be pretty pure. And then what you typically do is concentrate it um, and then play with it. So, hope that helps.